Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together with Dr. Kaylee Yakina on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network. I'm Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and I'm filling in for Dr. Kaylee Yakina. He's the president of the Grassroot Institute. And have you ever wondered why it's so difficult to afford a house in the islands? I'm sure everyone wonders this. And, you know, Hawaii has the least affordable housing of any state in the nation right now. Why is it so hard to build housing for local families? Well, today we're talking with Dean Uchida, president of the Building Industry Association of Hawaii. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Joe. Appreciate it. Well, first, before we get into the housing issue, mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell us about your background? Sure. Um, I worked for about 20 years with the state of Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, doing conservation land, um, figuring out what to do with all the sugar lands once the plantations closed. And in the last six or seven years, I was running the land division. We were responsible for all the state-owned lands in Hawaii. <clears throat> then I, was, I worked for a national housing developer. Um, I ran the Land Use Research Foundation, LERF, a nonprofit trade organization. And currently, I'm working as a um, consultant or project manager with uh, SSFM International. We do okay. engineering and consulting work. And uh, so if there's anyone that knows more about land, it's, uh, it's you, right? <laughs> so, but you've seen the, the <clears throat> lands in Hawaii over time, and so you have a broad picture of mm -hmm. what's happened uh, to land in Hawaii and housing. So what has happened over time? Well, there's been a lot of uh, regulatory controls on, you know, basically urbanizing the land. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're a state of 4 million acres total, but half of the land is in conservation, half is in ag. Uh, only about 200,000 acres total statewide is urbanized. So that's about 5% of the land right. of statewide is zoned for housing, right. you're saying. Urban. Right. So, but that means that um, it goes against the intuition of most people, which is to say, well, the reason that we don't have a lot of housing on the islands is because we're an island and we just, there, there's no more room to build. Is there any more room to build? Well, we we're kind of a victim of our own success, right? There's a lot of... Um, uh, community outrage about, you know, uh, developing agricultural lands, uh, keep the country country, mm -hmm. right? And so that uh, in Honolulu, anyway, the, the solution was putting in the, the rail system, and that would force all future developments and density to be packed along the rail transit corridor. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't have this need to reclassify lands in the agricultural district. Right, right. right. That, that was the thinking. Right. Um, I guess we'll, we're still waiting for that to happen, I guess. <laughs> right, but, um, right. but you also mentioned that um, you watched um, the fall of the sugarcane industry right. and uh, a lot of the plantation industry over time. Um, and so saving uh, lands as agriculture, as you said, about half the land in the state is, mm -hmm. is preserved as agricultural land. Um, the result of that has been... Um, the, the dying of the sugar plantation. How, 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 why did that happen? Well, sugar and pineapple were like monocultures, right? One, one crop. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have a robust ag economy behind it that could take up the lands in quantities that would, would be required to take down a plantation. You had the small mom and pop, one, five acre farms, but nothing on the scale that you need to take down thousands of acres at one time. Uh -huh, yeah. And as time went on, all the infrastructure started falling apart, right? Mm -hmm. The plantation was essentially a city or village because it took care of its, all, its own irrigation, its roads, everything. Mm -hmm. Once it shut down, nobody took care of the irrigation ditches. And so yeah. land has no value without water, right? So just preserving land and agriculture isn't enough to keep the gardens growing. You actually have to... Uh, Economics pay, right, plays a factor right, in this right, as well, right? right. And you're, you mentioned earlier that um, regulations have also hindered the development of more housing in the state, which I know l many local families uh, want more housing. We all want more housing. Mm -hmm. Why can't we build it? Well, the, the state has like this, the Land Use Commission and reclassifying land. So there's that whole land use entitlement process. So you got the State with. Land Use Commission, right. which is, which, um, Zones, you know, urban, land, urban, urban, agriculture, conservation, and, conservation rural. and rural, and it reclassifies the land. Okay, right. so that's a top that's a state, agency. Right. Okay. So once that's done, then you go to the county, and the county then rezones the land. If it's in urban now, 
rezoned for apartment, commercial, residential, right? So you, so you have state zoning, you just said, right. and you have county zoning. Uh, right. So you've got kind of layers of a, right. of a cake here, right. okay? And like Coral Ridge, the most recent one that people might be familiar with, that took you know, 20 years to, to develop, right? To go through the land use commission and county zoning. Um, there's a lot of litigation, a lot of challenges to the land use commission decisions. So that delay, you know, really speaks to the fact that developers need to have deep pockets. They need mm. to be able to carry a negative for a long period of time in order to go through this long, you know, involved land use entitlement process. Right. Every year they have, they have to pay money just to wait. Right. And they're not making any money, right? Mm. The land is still out there in ag or former ag land. So there's that component. There's, there's also the, um, the county governments tend to use inclusionary zoning and exactions. What is the inclusionary zoning? What does it's, that mean? It means like if you're going to build a housing project, so you're going to put in 100 units. Okay. Um, most counties would require you to build maybe a percentage of that 20 to 30 percent be affordable, price that 80 percent you know, area median income. Okay, so I'm, I'm, let's say I'm, uh, let's pretend that I'm a home builder. Mm -hmm. I want to build 100 homes. Um, and you're saying that this inclusionary zoning um, says that I, that I have to build a portion of that to be affordable homes, right. is that right? Right. And it's different on every county. Right. Okay, so well, that sounds like a good might, thing. Yeah. Then, the percentage right? might change slightly, right? right? Right. But So that sounds like a good thing, but does that get in the way too sometimes? Or? Well, it, all it means is that in order to subsidize the housing at that lower income level, the prices or some of the prices of the other units have to be a lot higher in order uh, to cover the costs, right? Okay. So it's a you know it's an economics game. The developer still has to make money. They're not going to build it and you know not make any money. So, so if I have a hundred, let's say I'm building a hundred homes, uh, thirty of those homes are going to be below market value. That means or affordable yeah. or affordable. And that means some of the other homes I build have to be above market value or, or what they would have been, yeah. just so I can make up the difference right, in the right. cost. So that means the higher homes become even more expensive. Is that right? Right. Okay. You need to subsidize that lower end. And that lower end is where you need the subsidy. That 80% and below, 60% and below uh, area median income is where government needs to put all its resources, its money, its land, because the private sector, you can't, it's not economical to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. If they were to do it and actually did it on a cost basis, the units would be really small, right? I mean, right. and so, you know, it's that, that balance, and government tries to uh, require developers to do this as opposed to, you know, building it on their own and creating incentives to build, build those units on their own. So we just talked about, um, you know, maybe three layers of, of maybe a six-layer cake <laughs> of regulations that uh, a home builder has to get through in order to um, build a house. Mm -hmm. And so what does that do to the home builder? How, how long does that take to get through that? Well, if you notice, the, the, the only two master plan communities on Oahu right now are Hopili and Coal Ridge, and that's Castle and Cook and D.R. Horton. Mm -hmm. um, Gentry's finishing up, Haseko's finishing up. Uh, you don't have a lot of um, medium and small size builders anymore. You have custom home builders, you have the one-offs, you know, that, that they're doing one house at a time, but nobody to fill that gap that can do 100 units at a time. A whole community, right. yeah, or 1,000 maybe. Yeah, because there's no, there's no developable land, there's no land that's entitled already, and infrastructure costs are so horrendous that you're going to need to do things on a large scale in order to make up the money, right? Right. And now they are, um, at least the Honolulu County, has uh, talked about adding more regulations onto the process. Right. Um, just, uh, I guess, recently there was a law passed that um, created new affordable housing rules. Mm -hmm. And those rules are now kind of um, clunking through uh, different uh, committees and, and departments right. and agencies right now uh, as they're being implemented. So what do these new rules do? Well, I think um, Avalon Sky Project in Alamana was the first project that they actually imposed some of the new laws on. Um, and they put a, a 30 year restriction on the affordable units. Okay, hold on. So, 30 year restriction on an affordable unit. So, let's say um, I am a low income family, I buy into one of those affordable units, and what, what does that restriction do? The restriction requires you that if you sell it, you have to sell it at that same income level. So essentially, after 10 years with inflation and everything, you can sell it to somebody at that same income level that you had 10 years ago, um, but you're not building any equity. 
You know, right. so at the end of the day, you're selling the unit pretty much for what you paid for it. Right. So you can't you can't make a profit, in other words. You may make a little bit, but yeah. no, I'm not sure if the law calls for like shared appreciation in that too, where the mm -hmm. developer, the city, gets some of the money. A back. small amount of profit, perhaps, yeah. but basically it would be more or less. You buy it for a certain price, and even 30 years later, you would sell it at that same price. Based on the income, right. So. And a lot of people, when they buy property, they buy it to live in, but they also buy it to as an investment mm -hmm. to try to earn more, more money in right. their lives, right? And they're trying to get ahead, especially folks who are on low income. When they buy a property, that might be the only um, you know, capital that they have to invest. Right. And uh, 30 years later, what you're saying is that this restriction, it sounds like that the res this restriction would rob them of the, um, of the money that they'd be otherwise able to make. Well, yeah, it would, it would really restrict their ability to build any equity over time, right? A healthy housing market allows people to buy in at a starter home. And as your income improves and your family need expand, you can sell that unit and move up to the next one. Income changes again, you can move up to the next one. But there's this constant movement. They call it a housing ladder. So you can move okay. up the ladder, right? Right. And then when you hit a certain point and you got, you're an empty nester now, so you and your wife don't need such a big house, you can go back down the ladder, right? Right, right. And buy a smaller unit. But that's kind of how the normal, typical housing market works on the mainland. Hawaii, you know, you buy a starter house and you're probably going to die in your house. You oh, know, yeah. You make your add-ons and everything. But... Um, there's not a lot of opportunity for people to move up because we have such a constricted supply at all price points. That's interesting. Right. So there's, you're saying there's a housing ladder. People can move up and down the ladder, just like I used to rent. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're thinking of buying another house, I mean, a, a new house, um, and moving out of our house that we have and selling that and so on. So we're, we can kind of move up the, the ladder. Yeah. But um, what you're saying, though, is some of these restrictions um, put glue on the ladder <laughs> and you're stuck on the, on the rung or yeah. something like that. Because when you sell your place, you're gonna, you have some equity in it now, and the market, the market value will reflect that. So that allows you to buy into a, a, a bigger house, a more expensive house, basically. Right, right. Right. So you just kind of move up the ladder. And at every point along the ladder, if that happens, you see, continue to have that opportunity to move forward. By restricting it, you know, you're not allowing the equity. And, becomes almost like an apartment after a while, right? You're just basically getting the same amount of money at the end of the 10-year period or 30-year period that you put into it. So. Right. So why rent, then, if when you buy, you don't get anything, any benefit extra out right. of that, right? So, yeah, it remains to be seen how this thing's going to play out. Like I said, Sky was the first project that they imposed this condition on. It's a new law, so the market still hasn't responded yet. Um, I'm anxious to see what other projects, how the law is applied to other projects going forward. Right. And, well, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, a few more well-intentioned regulations that sometimes get in the way. And, um, but um, you're watching Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network. I'm here with Dean Uchida, president of the Building Industry Association of Hawaii. Don't go away. We'll be right back. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network. I'm Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Today we're talking with Dean Uchida, President of the Building Industry Association of Hawaii, about affordable housing. We all want it. How do we get it? Um, we're talking with Dean Uchida. And we left off, we were talking about a kind of a regulation that um, is really thick, like I got the whole regulation right here. <laughs> and uh, it's pages and pages of more information and more rules that uh, home builders 
um, have to deal with. So, and what does that do? Uh, do did you say to the to the market here? Well, it it it, um, it it's actually a recurring theme. Right? It is the same type of um, government approach to trying to build more affordable housing. It was done in the '90s, and they had what they called buyback and shared appreciation, where they would, they would try and control how the unit could be sold in the future. Oh, it's similar mm. to what we just talked right, about. Right. So. Um, if you buy into an affordable unit, uh, when you sell it, it has to be pretty much the same price, mm -hmm. and then you don't get any appreciation on. Well, they had shared appreciation, so the county would take a portion of that. You would get a percentage, the county would get a percentage, so any kind of appreciation, but you don't get the full equity, right? Right. Um, but while it looks, these, these. And you're saying they, they tried that before, right, back in the they 90s. Right, in the 90s. Okay. And it usually is uh, resulting of a market, a housing market that's going in an up cycle. Mm -hmm. Right, the housing market is a cyclical kind of market, and as soon as things turn down, um, what happened was some of the uh, the, the, the non-affordable units, the market or the, the higher price ones, in a down economy, the prices started dropping, and uh, the price of the market unit was almost equal to the price of the affordable unit, and so buyers, given the choice between a unit that had no restrictions and an affordable unit that had restrictions, we're not buying the affordable I units. I see. So you've got a market that goes up and down, mm -hmm. and when it goes on the downswing, the price of the house matches the same as the affordable right. unit. So then why would anyone buy an affordable, right, you're right. saying? And that's what happened in the 90s. Right. And the county, the council had to go back in and re uh, suspend some of those conditions in order to make the, the units, you know, price at the same, I mean, more competitively priced affordable units. And, and so you're so saying that there might be a glut of affordable housing, let's say if the market goes down, as many people might th think that it will in the future. Well, it'll be the buyers making the choice, right? Do whether you buy a unit with the restrictions or you buy one without restrictions. And so right. um, if you remove the restrictions, you get more affordable units in the market. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, that, that's what happened the last time when the, the council removed some of the restrictions. So when, when <clears throat> uh, governments are um, making these rules and regulations, are they trying to get in the way, or do you think it's well-intentioned? No, I think, I think everybody understands that we really have a housing problem in Hawaii, and I think the counties are trying their best to come up with ways of trying to figure out how they can build more affordable housing. Um, you know, I, I think, at least from my perspective, you know, Hawaii is at this inflection point right now where we have an opportunity to be proactive and do housing the right way, um, or we can continue doing it where the counties wait for individual projects to come in and basically do their inclusionary zoning as the projects come in. Um, you know, we're, we're not, we, I think DBED did a study a couple of years ago where 66,000 units short given natural population growth over a 10-year period up to 2025. You say 66,000? 66, 66,000 units will be short. And so, you know, knowing that, um, city and county of Honolulu is, I think, 25,000 over the 10-year period. So you do the math and say, then they should be putting out 2,500 new building permit starts every year. And But we're only building, uh, what, 1,000 or two every year? or how? I think it was about 800, 900 okay. new starts last year. Or so last we're way years. below and what we keep that, falling, to reach. Yeah, we keep falling farther and farther behind. Mm. So, so you know, when you have a supply that's restricted and you have the demand just seems to keep going up, then the price is going to go up. Right. So I guess we predict that prices won't get any uh, better anytime soon. Well, we just hit like $812,000, I think, for a median price home on Oahu, right? Um, but if we can shift, like this inflection point, shift government's thinking into being more proactive, right? Yeah, what, would that, what would proactive mean? They, when, they, when they're doing their community plans and their reclass, I mean, they're, they're identifying where growth's going to be in the future, commit to that growth, put in the infrastructure necessary, and the market will respond, right? I if see. You, you get developable lands out there with infrastructure, you know, and if you just restrict it to workforce housing, you know, 140% AMI and below, that's where the sweet spot is. That's where the huge demand is. That's where our workforce is, basically. Right. So to provide for that market. Right? You're saying that, um, let's say there's a garden, and um, we want to um, till the soil. We want to get the, you know, get it fertilized, and so we can watch it grow. Right. Well, in the same, uh, a similar way, if government um, put the entitlements in place for developers to build on the land that we have, then we we could just sit back and watch it grow. Right. And it wouldn't necessarily be high-end ho housing that they build there. You're saying there's a market for the mid-range and right. the low-range housing, too. 
And the price point is going to, you know, basically reflect that. The type of product you get will reflect that. You know, you're not going to be building um, a lot of amenities on this workforce housing. They want, they want bedrooms. They want area. They don't want pools and spas and all of this right, stuff, right? Right, right. So you can kind of tailor what you're offering in the community to that price point that you're targeting. That's right? interesting. You know, when I was uh, looking for to, to rent a house recently, I saw some houses that had pools and stuff. Uh, I uh, get. I'll go to the beach, right? Yeah. You know. <laughs> so because for me, you know, what's important to me is you know the square footage right. of the space. Shelter, right, so, right, right. Yeah. And so I, I think a lot of families are, are you know in that position. They're going to look at this thing and say, I don't want all of that stuff. I just want a shelter. I want a decent living area. I want a good location. Mm -hmm. um, and you can let the price dictate that, right? Right. I mean, Do you, what are some other solutions that you have to help um, free up? Um, the, or the market for affordable housing, would you say? Well, I think um, there, there needs to be a recognition that government and the private sector have to partner on the housing issue. Um, the government can't build, it, build their way out of the problem themselves, and neither can the private sector. Mm -hmm. You need government to assist at the lower end, like we talked about. They need to provide land and funds to build at that lower end for the lower income group. They also need to lead the charge on infrastructure. We need to have infrastructure capacity investment, uh, investment in infrastructure capacity throughout the state or else, you know, these projects are going to be faced with huge infrastructure costs on top of the entitlement, on top of the actual cost to build the housing. Mm -hmm. If right. you want to, you know, that's where this partnership comes in is, you know, the, the, the city, the county is going to realize increased tax revenue from the real property tax from all this improved property, right? Mm, right. So they're, it's not like they're investing in infrastructure and not getting anything back. There is going to be a return based on the real property tax you're going to get. I see. But we need some leadership to show that, you know, there is going to be a partner, that we need to understand roles and responsibilities and move forward with the idea of trying to set some maybe production goals for housing by county. Right, right. right. Uh, unless we start looking at the numbers and really committing to building, we're never going to build our way out of 66,000 units. Right. right. So, and why are you involved in this fight? Um, You've been working in the land use area for a long time. Um, is this something that um, you see a lot of families want in, in Hawaii? And um, so, what, why are you involved in this? Well, it, it's it's about living in Hawaii. It's about I, personally, I got two kids that I want to get them out of my house. But <laughs> 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 Me and my wife were empty nesters for a while, but they uh -huh. came back. They can't afford to buy a house in Hawaii, right? Right. Um, and I look at that in the future, and you know, if we want to keep the best and brightest kids in Hawaii, we're going to need to provide them housing opportunities. You want to attract employers to bring knowledge-based jobs to Hawaii, you're going to have to retain an educated workforce, you're going to have to house them someplace. Mm -hmm. So housing is, a, to me, a critical component of our overall economy. And if we want to grow, we need to really think long and hard about how we're going to fix our housing problem. Would you say that housing also has a factor in agriculture? Mm -hmm. This is something a lot of people want, you know, let's, let's bring agriculture back. Um, but where are they going to live? Right, and you need to attract, you know, we, need, we, we don't have a very good business climate here. You need to attract those middle-sized farmers that, you know, want to farm land. We've got a lot of land, we've got a lot of water, but no farmers, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, so opening up opportunities on the ag side, I mean, looking at different markets instead of just the, the West Coast market, maybe looking at Asia as another market, right? And doing value added to just don't grow stuff and ship it out. Right. Um, so you're saying that, uh, you know, opening up more uh, regulations for housing would help um, agriculture, it might help tax revenue, it might help just the economy boom as a whole? Well, it'll help families get started. I mean, you need to have built communities, right? And then you get a lot of, all of the bad stuff kind of goes away. You know, you don't get as much homelessness. You get a lot more people caring about one another. Um, you build communities, right, instead right. of just individual dwellings. And right. so you need, young people need to get out there, they need to have a stake in the community. You get better schools, mm -hmm. you get better programs, right. sports, everything, right? right. Um, so it's kind of the, uh, the solution to a lot of uh, the problems in Hawaii. Well, it has the potential to do that. It yeah. has, you know, it, it's going to play a role, but it, it plays a large role the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the affordable housing problem in, in Hawaii um, is kind of a hard thing to just fix with one thing. Here today, we're talking about this rule at the, um, at the Honolulu Council level. Um, is the rule done? Is it, is it all finished? Or is there a flexibility to um, perhaps um, make the case that 
uh, there might be better solutions to housing. I think the law, um, well, the law's on the books, you know, it's a, the, the ordinance has already passed. They're in the rulemaking stage on the implementation side. Uh, I think it's going to take a while for us to work through the problem and maybe see there's unintended consequences from this rule being passed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like what we talked about earlier, Maui passing that 50 percent affordable housing requirement. Right, right. They yeah. thought they were doing wonders for the industry. Mm -hmm. And what happened? It just shut it all down. Right? What, what about uh, monster houses? You're, you're mentioning that, um, you know, regulations um, sometimes have unintended consequences. And yeah. now we've got these monster houses. Is that just the market behaving badly or where did that come from? Monster houses is a symptom of our lack of supply of housing. Mm -hmm. um, they're not houses, they're apartments in residential neighborhoods, and that's what people are objecting to. Uh, you know, you, you, you see a lot of multi-generational housing in Hawaii, and that's where you're going to run into problems is you try and limit the size of the house by trying to go after monster houses. You're also hurting local families who are trying to provide shelter for their loved ones. Yeah, right? it's interesting that uh, we have um, a diverse community in Hawaii, uh, many of which have a culture of having large families in their house. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of, you know, kids can stay home and, and grandma can stay home and take care of baby right. and, and so on. So you have this culture. And um, I don't really see them as monster houses so much as um, this is a cultural outcome to some extent. But also you're saying it's a regulatory outcome. Mm -hmm. As we squeeze the balloon uh, on one side, it kind of pops out the right. other side. Right. I mean, families, young people, who can afford an $800,000 mortgage? I mean, I don't know any young people that can. So they're forced to stack on top of each other. You're right? saying that's the median uh, That's the median income. price yeah, on, on Oahu, right? Right. Well, that's uh, a lot for us to chew on, a lot for <laughs> us to think about. And uh, hopefully we can all uh, one day afford uh, a, a place in Hawaii. Um, my name is Joe Kent. I'm the executive vice president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. You've been watching Hawaii Together. And I, my guest today was Dean Uchida, president of the Building Industry Association of Hawaii. Thanks so much for joining us. Aloha.